Okay, good morning. I am so thrilled to be here again. Um, I love the Czech Republic. In particular, I love Brno, and I love this conference. And I love seeing so many familiar faces in the audience too. Um, we're a small group around the world looking at this topic, but I think a very passionate group. Uh, we care a lot about academic integrity, and we care about our students. So today, I, oh, and I have to say, I'm really looking forward to the social program. I've said to Tomash, one of the things that I love about this conference is, yes, we'll exchange a lot of ideas and we'll talk a lot. It's going to be very challenging and interesting. But more than that, we will have the chance to get to know each other. We will become colleagues, collaborators and friends. And hopefully that will mean we really will share best practice internationally. That will make all the difference. So today, my topic is about courage. The need for courage to enact, to put into practice, to put into place academic integrity. Now, the first part of my presentation, I'm going to introduce you to virtue ethics. It's a little bit theoretical. Um, any philosophers here in the room? Yay, you might be able to help me. <laughs> I hope it's not too boring. A little bit of theory, really, not because I want to bore you, but because we need to have a language, a shared language to articulate these ideas. So a little bit of an introduction to virtue ethics, and then talking about courage, courage as a virtue and how courage then relates to academic integrity. I'm going to share with you some models of courage. I'm going to talk about the fundamental values of academic integrity according to the International Centre for Academic Integrity. We have Teddy Fishman here, the director of the ICAI, and you'll be hearing from her tomorrow and throughout the conference. I'm going to talk about why courage is particularly important in higher education now, more than ever. And I hope if I have time, because I think I've got enough time, I'm watching my clock, I hope to share with you some case studies from around the world where universities have shown courage to enact academic integrity. So a little bit of an explanation first. You don't need to take notes, there won't be a pop quiz at the end. Okay, just remember, I'm really just sharing this with you so that we have a way of articulating this idea. So virtue ethics is a blend of Aristotelian and Christian philosophy. So Aristotle's starting point was that it is human nature, so it's innate, it's who we are, it's human nature for every activity to aim at some good. We want to do good. This was the philosophy of Aristotle. This good is described as a type of flourishing. I love that word flourishing because one of my favourite images, you'll see I'm wearing this, is a tree. And a tree has a lot of metaphors. It's about flourishing and growing, being strong, having roots deep in the ground. So I love the metaphor of flourishing. Or a state of being well and doing well in being well. Wow. Being well, doing well and being well. So wanting to do well. So virtues are those qualities which enable an individuals to achieve this flourishing. We all want to do well. We all want to do good. What are the virtues which help us to do that? So Aristotle identified nine virtues, and you can see them listed there. So wisdom, prudence, justice, fortitude, there's courage, beautifully highlighted, liberality, magnificence, magnanimity, and temperance. So I'm interested in this virtue of courage. The thing to remember about the way Aristotle was talking about virtues is he said, it's the mean between two opposite ends of a continuum. So on the one side, you have cowardliness, being scared of everything, not being able to move, being frightened. On the other end, you have rashness, rushing in and doing things without thinking, thinking you're brave, but in fact, you're being rash, imprudent, not making a good decision. But courage is the virtue in the middle. It's not rushing in and being crazy. It's also not being scared. It's something in the middle. So it's about having some judgment. So. Other people, other people who talk about virtue ethics talk about the four cardinal moral virtues, and there it is again. Courage is one of those, alongside temperance, wisdom, and justice. So the thing about virtues is often people say, well, if you're talking about virtues, isn't that just something we're born with? You're either a good person or you're not. You're either a courageous person or you're not. And that's not the case, because the exercise of virtues requires a capacity to judge our capacity to judge and to do the right thing in the right place at the right time in the right way, according to McIntyre, whose seminal work is on virtue ethics. That sounds like you might be God if you could do the right thing at the right time in the right way, basically being perfect. Not quite true, of course, because none of us are perfect, but it is about the capacity to judge, to judge for action. 
So there is still a need for laws and rules, which prohibit certain activities and provide recommendations for related consequences. So when I'm talking about virtue ethics, having courage for academic integrity, I'm not talking about having no rules. Rules have an important place. However, the thing about virtue ethics is understanding that rules by themselves are not enough because there can never be a rule for every situation. Yeah? So judgment of any situation can't be reduced to just routine application of those rules. Yeah? Because then you have these particular, complex, difficult cases. We were just walking across from the hotel and we were talking, sharing together complex cases that the rules that we have in our universities or our institutions just don't cover it. So what happens then? We have the rules, they're very important, but we have particular complex cases that require special judgment. And in that case, there's no formula you can apply. That's why the virtues are so important. McIntyre says that whenever we're talking about the virtues, virtues don't exist in isolation. They must be engendered, created, established in a community where those virtues are to be practised. We are that community. We are the academic community. In this case, we are the community of academic integrity researchers and practitioners. So the virtues that we care about must be established and gendered in this community. That community needs to have shared agreement about goals. And then having said that, we have rules, we have this shared agreement, and then we need to create that shared understanding. We need systematic training. We don't just suddenly have the virtues just by being in the room. It doesn't happen by osmosis. So you'll be starting to think about where I'm going with this. So we're talking about virtues, about judgment, about courage, we're talking about rules and procedures and consequences, and we're talking about systematic tra training. All of these things are what we need for academic integrity. So according to Anas, in the handbook of ethics actually, she said, a flourishing life of virtue is built on a personal aspiration to be better than we are. I love that so much. An aspiration to be better than we are. Now my children would laugh at this, because they would say, oh, mum, I want to be the best person I can be. <laughs> That's me. And uh, whenever I explain to them about rules and consequences, I want to be the best person I can be. But it's true. It is true. I do want to be the best person I can be. I want to be better than I am, which is why virtue ethics appeals to me so much. We talk about, in terms of virtue, to reach an ideal of thought and behaviour and to improve ourselves beyond what is possible than simply following the rules. So we have the rules, we need the rules, but we want to go beyond the rules. Now, those of you who heard me speak here two years ago, I talked about policy, exemplary academic integrity policy. I've spent a lot of my research in the last few years talking about what is an exemplary academic integrity policy, how do you develop it, what are the, how do you describe a breach, how do you respond to a breach, and so on. This takes us beyond that policy. We need that, we do but we need to go beyond that to an ideal, an aspiration of being better than we are. So here's the thing, according to virtue ethics philosophy, a person practicing virtue ethics would determine their own behavior based on what an exemplary ethical person would do. We would base our behavior thinking about what an exemplary ethical person would do. We would ask, who is my role model? What is best practice? Now, isn't that the reason we're all here today? To think about what is exemplary best practice? What is this person or this university doing that we can emulate in our own institution? So we are looking to exemplars of virtue, are we not? By being here. So who are our role models in terms of academic integrity? Who do we look to for models of courage? I want you to take a moment and think about that. Who do you think of when you think of models of courage? Or another way to say it is, who are the heroes in our everyday life? Are you thinking? Can I see the little thought bubbles in your head? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, I wanted to share with you some of my models of courage, and I think you'll recognize all of the people in these photos. Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Malala Yousafzai. Oh, I actually wrote this down. Yousab Sai, I can never remember how to say her name. You all know who Malala is? This lovely girl here? Yep. Someone who stood up and said, education for women's important, and got a bullet to the head in thanks. 
um, Nelson, and I mentioned Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Bruce Park, and you might recognize this nameless woman who's a suffragette who stood up for women's rights, nicely being arrested. So all of those people, none of those people are rich. None of those people were famous in the sense that we might think of, though they became famous afterwards. All of them have suffered a great deal. All of them stood up for something they believed in, every single one. They normally stood up against injustice. Now, they're my models because I, like, I would like to live my life according to the same sort of values. Um, being patient is part of this courageous model. You think of Nelson Mandela in jail for 25 years and came out with compassion. So the virtues are about aspiring to be better than we are. I don't believe I could be in jail for 25 years and come out compassionate, but he did. So I aspire to that, whether I can achieve that or not. So thinking about our exemplars of courage, these are the people I think of in my everyday life. So some of the traits of courageous people, the willingness to speak up, all of those people I just showed you pictures of, they were all willing to speak up. Here's one for me, something for me to remember, the willingness to be quiet and to listen. That also can take courage. Sometimes, remember, we have, we're looking at courage as something as a, the mean between rashness and, and being scared, cowardliness. So some, rather than being rash, sometimes we have to sit quietly and listen. That also takes courage when we think we know the answer. The willingness to take action. That is something that really distinguishes courage. You can't be a courageous person sitting doing nothing. It requires action. The willingness to go against or maybe beyond perceived wisdom and even laws and rules. So remember, virtue ethics, we need those rules, but those rules are not enough. It requires judgment. We need to be able to understand the situation we're in, apply the rules and perhaps go beyond the rules. Here's a sad thing, this one. The willingness to be an outcast. Now, Tomasz mentioned I've been working on this topic for 15 years, and I'm in a business school at a very lovely university, the University of South Australia. But when I first started looking at this topic, I was told, make no mistake, this was not a topic to do research on. Plagiarism was not a topic that we should be looking at. I certainly shouldn't be looking at academics' publication ethics. I shouldn't be looking at fraud or falsification. These were dangerous, dangerous topics. And I probably spent the first three years fighting, fighting, fighting to even be allowed to write on the topic. Um, but I have persevered because I really love it. I really believe in it. And for me, academic integrity underpins everything we do. So I, I can't do anything else, actually. Once the topic gets to you, you're like, it seems like the most crucial thing as an academic to in, want to ensure the integrity of all academic work. But you might need to be an outcast in your institution. Not always. Trust me, it will come. The good times will come when you do the good work and your senior staff start to support you, but it may not come straight away. The willingness to lead by example. Now, this is a tough one. Teddy and I often talk about this. Because sometimes people will be angry at you. They will say, oh, you're such a goody-goody. You know, are you better than me? You know, do you, I bet you've never plagiarised. And the, and the scary thing is, we were talking about this yesterday, maybe if somebody went back to my undergraduate degree and looked at what I did when I was an 18-year-old in my essay, I don't know that I could say I'm squeaky clean because I had all the same issues that every other student has. I didn't understand academic integrity. I didn't understand what I was doing at university. I probably didn't have the skills to paraphrase, to summarise, to reference. I probably took it very, with a very cavalier approach. Who knows? I'm scared, actually, to do that. I don't, don't anybody do it. I'm not making that suggestion. But when you're aware that you are talking about this topic, people will want to cut you down and make make you look like you've also made a mistake. So the challenge for us is not to say we are better than anybody else, because we're not. We have all the same challenges, the same difficulties. But being, being aware that we do need to lead by example. For that reason, for example, Tomasz mentioned the Handbook of Academic Integrity. It's a lovely um, volume of about 400,000 words. There are many people in the audience who've contributed to that book. And one of the things about that book is wanting to ensure the integrity of the writing process, even using things like Turnitin, a text matching software, to make sure that our work really was authentic. Because it matters, we need to lead by example. 
The next point, wisdom to know when to fight and when to withdraw. So I've mentioned I had a lot of struggles early on in my work on academic integrity and sometimes I just had to sit back quietly and just wait for things to happen. It's not always going to go as you wish. The ability to feel, show and live compassion. Now part of my job at the University of South Australia, I'm in the School of Business, is to determine outcomes for breaches of academic integrity by undergraduate and postgraduate students. We have a beautiful policy at my university, we do. But our students' lives are so complex and our staff's lives are so complex. I see people come into my office that, okay, the rules apply, but I need to show compassion. I really do. Um, it's not to say that I'm not going to apply an appropriate outcome, an appropriate learning outcome. Some people would call it a penalty. I will apply that, but I will do it with compassion and love for my student. But sometimes, last week I had 25 cases in the lead up to coming away. 25 cases, it was like, next, next, you know. And I found myself talking to my students in a very, I won't say mean, but I was tough. I was really getting tougher and tougher as the week went by. And I really had to stop myself and say, every student is an individual. Just because the student before had cheated, just because the student before had bought their assignment, doesn't mean this student has done that. So every single student I meet with, I need to show compassion because I'm using the rules, I'm following the policy, but I'm showing courage and virtue by going beyond just the rules. And the last point, perseverance, resilience, fortitude, and patience. That really does wrap it all up very well. So I want to be, and I think everyone in this room would like to be, a courageous person, a courageous academic, a courageous person in terms of academic integrity. We also want to be a good person. Do we just want to be a good person or do we want to be courageous? Maybe both, but there is a difference between the two. A couple of years ago at the International Centre for Academic Integrity Conference, Gus Lee did a great presentation on courage in leadership and this comes from his book with his partner. He says there's the character matrix and you can see on one side, this side, you have the good person. The good person stands on the safe bank. They're doing the right thing, nothing wrong with them. They avoid personal wrongs, they don't make mistakes, they try to follow a code of ethics, they tell the truth, they don't lie, cheat or steal. They have a framework to determine their behaviour. They are a good person, nothing wrong with that, we want to be a good person too. But this person, the courageous person, stands on the far bank. Sometimes, like I said, an outcast, sometimes someone well beyond what is the standard norm. They take risks for principles. They stand up and take action. Where the good person stays safe, the courageous person might step outside of that safety. The courageous person acts with integrity. Remember what we talked about virtues? Having the virtues is about doing the right thing in the right time at the right place as we wish, we wish we could do that. Well, someone who is courageous has integrity and tries to, at least, discern, show judgment, act rightly, and to teach others. That's the other thing which is so important about a courageous person. We're not just being courageous so that we can stand alone like a beacon of light. We are being courageous so that we can share, mentor, and teach others. Again, that's why we're all here today, isn't it? To share and teach and mentor others. A courageous person actually works to stop the wrong. They can see something is wrong and they act to stop it. They challenge injustices. Now, in this conference, I know I've looked at the program and I've talked to lots of people already. I know that the topic, for example, of contract cheating, ghost writing, file sharing is going to come up again and again. In my institution and in Australia right now, that is the big challenge. We're not just talking about students cutting and pasting some paragraphs from the internet overstepping the lines. Until this year, my main challenge with my students was really teaching them academic literacies. How, how do you reference, Why? how do you use sources and so on. This year though, with my 25 cases just last week, I would say about a half of those that I'm seeing are students who are outright cheating. They're actually buying their assignments, downloading files and so on. Now that has changed the whole face of what we're doing. It's so deliberate. So. I'm challenging that as an injustice. I'm challenging that as an affront to the integrity of the educational process. I want to stop that, I really do. And I don't just want to punish students. Uh, Phil and I were talking about this last night and he's, I know he's gonna talk about ghostwriting. 
Stopping the wrong requires a multi-pronged approach, not just blaming students. For example, I believe in legislation. We'll talk about this throughout the conference. In Australia, we are working together in the sector to try to make it illegal for those cheat sites to exist. Yes, the students need to have an appropriate outcome if they, if they cheat. We also need to attack the issue at the source, because to me, that's an injustice and a wrong. So they require a multi-pronged approach. And the character of a, of a courageous person is one that has sustained integrity and courage. Sustained. So not just today. You don't just do the right thing today. You don't just stand up for your issue right now. It's something you do over the long term, the long haul. And I have to say, you know, it's been 15 years. And when I first started, as I said, there was no support for, in my institution for what I was doing. But it wasn't just that. There was no understanding either. And I can see real change over time. Real change. It's so exciting. I'm so optimistic. Now, at my university, people from all around different divisions come and ask me my opinion on what to do. I'm like, really? And just, just yesterday, just yesterday, our library, I met with them, and the library has been someone, they're like, oh, we do our thing, you do yours. The library just sent me an email yesterday saying, we've put up all these resources, thank you for the links, you know, linking to all my projects. We think that's going to really help staff. I'm like, really, really, really? So exciting. But that's the sustained element of what we do. So, getting to the heart of what I want to talk about, which is virtues and academic integrity. So, links can be made between the virtues and the way that academic integrity is articulated by the ICAI, the International Centre for Academic Integrity. So, academic integrity is premised on five fundamental values, and I'm sure you all know this, honesty, trust, respect, fairness and responsibility, according to the Fundamental Values Project in 99. Those values are enabled and put into action by the virtue of courage. So you can look, look at those five fundamental values, but if you don't have courage to enact it, if you don't have courage to put it into action, those words mean almost nothing. So you want the values, but you want the virtue of courage to put it into action. So this is a, and I'm going to read it with you, the revised fundamental values of academic integrity shows how central courage is to everything. So according to the revised definition, I'll read it with you, Courage is an element of character, we've talked about that, character, that allows learners to commit to the quality of their education by holding themselves and their fellow learners to the highest standards of academic integrity, even when doing so involves risks of negative consequences or, or appraisal. Being courageous means acting in accordance with one's convictions. Totally agree. Like intellectual capacity, courage can only develop in environments where it's tested. We are tested on this every day. It's not easy. It's not easy to always stand up for what's right. Members of academic communities must learn not only to make integrous decisions, but also to display the courage necessary to follow their decisions with action. We'll talk about that in a second. Only through the ex exercise of courage is it possible to create and maintain communities of integrity strong enough to endure as responsible, respectful, trustworthy, fair and honest, regardless of the circumstances they face. I love that so much. You can go to the ICAI website and look at you know, the detail of the fundamental, project, fund fundamental values project, including this revision. I think it's important that courage has been added to that to show that we need to stand up. And you can see all of the various things we've talked about with virtue ethics right there, you know, acting with, according with your um, convictions. It talks about a community of practice, about growing that, establishing that, teaching that, training all of us to be courageous as well. Um, and it talks about sustainability, long term. We want long term for this issue to continue and to make a mark. So I hope I've explained what virtue ethics is, why courage is so important, and how the link is to academic integrity. So why am I thinking courage is so important for academic communities? It sounds like we're going out to battle, doesn't it? We know, let's put our armour on. And I guess it's sort of a bit like that metaphorical armour, because sometimes it can feel like that. Um, I was explaining this morning to Phil and to Irene at breakfast that um, one of the cases I had last week was for a master's student, an MBA student. And, you know, this is one of my next, next, next students. And he came in, and it was clear to me that he had not written his assignment. But I was waiting for him to explain. I said, please explain what's going on here. And he said, well, you know, we work in a lot of groups in the MBA. And the first thing we do when we get our group task is we sit down together and we say, should we buy it or should we write it ourselves? And we make the decision on which one is quicker and easier. 
Should we buy it is their first question. And he said, but I want to assure you, I, we sometimes write it. We sometimes we do because we think we can do it. And in this assignment, we could have done it, but it was quicker to buy it. And I was just like, uh-huh. All righty. Really? I don't know what to do with that. So why is courage? So in this case, I have... I have some dilemmas, you know, I've got, I need to be quite strong. I've got a policy, again, a very good policy that I need to apply, but I need to go beyond just that one student and that one group. I need to get to the heart of this. So now we're having a whole, because of that discussion, now we are completely re-examining every assignment that's been submitted for the last two years in the MBA. Now that requires real resources. Now, 15 years ago, my university would not have given me those resources they have given me the resources because they are shocked by that too. When you have it so blatantly in your face, you can only feel, I think, that you need to stand up. So thinking about our environment, you know, why is courage so important now? We're in a very complex educational environment. I would think more complex than ever before. We've got the fact that higher education is increasingly competitive in terms of student admissions, university ranking systems, government funding, research, funding and status. We are just talking at breakfast this morning about, you know, our universities are ranked according to a certain list. And if you're too low on the list, nobody even wants to work with you. Talk about competition, very difficult. There is less job and career security for the academic workforce. 80% of our staff in Australia are sessional staff. That means they're hourly paid. They're casual staff. They go from contract to contract. They don't get paid over the Christmas break. They don't have rec leave. They don't have long service leave, sick leave, none of that. They're paid by the hour. And those are the people at the, in the front line seeing this sort of issue. We don't pay them enough to go through all our turn it in reports when there's a 40%, 50%, 60% text match and do something about it. That takes time. So that's complex. That makes a big difference. The massification, I know that this is a word we use in Australia a lot, and the commercialisation of higher education. By massification, I mean the opening up of higher education to a very large cohort of people, a very diverse community. Whereas perhaps 30 years ago or so, 30 or 40 years ago, when we were all, not all of you, I see some young people here, I'll look for some older people like myself. Where are they? I can't find them. Yeah, hey, okay, in the front, yeah. When we were students. You know, when we were students, it was a much more elite ent enterprise. You had to actually get in by credit. You had to achieve very well on your exams. It's a bit different now. In Australia, we have an aspiration to have 40% of our 18 to 24-year-olds in university. Whether they're ready or not, we're going to have them there. So that's what I talk about, the massification. The commercialisation of higher education too, you know, in addition to having an increasingly diverse student body, the commercialisation means that those people are now, are they, are they students? Are they customers? You know, they're paying a large amount of money. That has an impact on what they can achieve and what they expect to achieve. This massification too results in a very diverse student body which is often socially and educationally disadvantaged. We have people coming into university with an ATAR, which is an, a tertiary entrance score, of 50. That's like 50% from high school. You got 50% for your high school and now you're coming in and doing a degree. It can be no surprise that those students are struggling with their academic literacies. 50%? Uh, that, that, you only know half of what you studied at high school? Um, corruption in wider society. Again, we've been talking about this. This issue of academic integrity is situated in a much bigger issue of corruption in the broader society. And it can be particularly strong in different countries. Um, you know, the Transparency International says that Australia is great, you know, apparently we have almost no corruption or no perception of corruption, but we do. We really do. And there are changing values and social norms. Um, our students are different to us. They really are. You know, um, the breakneck changes in technology. When I'm talking to a group of students like this, they're on, so on social media, Facebook and Twitter and so on, which isn't to say that's not a, a bad thing, but they're multitasking in a way that is very different than the way my brain works. They're, they're listening to a whole bunch of stuff, you know, and they're downloading files, they're, they're taking music, they're looking at free movies. I mean, the way they see knowledge and language and information is very different to how I see it. So that does have an impact on how they engage with issues of academic integrity. So that broader complexity results in a very complex classroom then. Um, in the Australian context, I can certainly speak about that. In a business school, we can have up to 50% of the students who speak an additional language. English is an additional language. 
Now, they are amazingly complex students because they might speak four or five languages. Amazing. You know, so they're talented and interesting and competent. But it does give them challenges when the language of instruction is in English in Australia. Their degree is in English. They're going to get a degree which says you graduated in English. And we have issues for our local students too. Remember I said 50%? A lot of our students come in with almost no English language training themselves, even when they are an English speaker. So their writing is very poor. Could talk about that a lot. Differing cultural and educational norms. I talked about how technology changes you know, the generations between instructors and students. But we also have, in a room like this, um, I would not be able to tell who's Australian and who's international. Our classroom is so diverse. I really can't tell who comes from where. And those different cultural norms can have an impact on people's expectations. In the Australian context, we have an increased reliance on fee-paying students, and that means international students. So there is a subtle and not so subtle pressure on staff to pass international students, perhaps with a different standard, which isn't to say that many of our international students do well. They do. They do very well. But there, it does change the dynamic when the whole program depends on those students to remain in the classroom. We talk about, in my context, we talk about the importance of retention. We must retain our students because they're, they're paying fees, right? But this whole pressure to retain students actually can be in conflict with maintaining standards and maintaining academic integrity. We talked about technology before. Well, we have an increased emphasis on online education, transnational education, teaching completely in the online environment where we never even see the student. We don't know who's taking the test. We don't know who's doing the examination. We don't know who's doing the assessment. Even when we use amazing software, online proctoring software, our students find a way around it. And some students have shared some amazing things with me. Even when you have a webcam on your computer looking at you, they have talked about having someone standing behind the computer just holding the book up and showing them. So, you know, so we have technology which improves things, but then that also is problematic. But transnational online education has its own issues. We know about the exponential rise in electronically available information. That's nothing new. Social media is still nothing too new. In Australia, we have very large classes. I've been talking with colleagues about my class. I have 700 students in my class. Now, I say the word class very loosely because then it's not my class. I know nobody. I don't know any student. But I have a team of tutors. I have 14 tutors. I try to know my tutors very well. But here's the irony. We have a large number of, of students in the class in a huge, big lecture theatre, but no compulsion to attend classes. It's not compulsory. So by the end of the semester, we may have, in this massive, big auditorium, we may have 30 students who are attending different students every week too. Mentioned the idea that students now might consider themselves to be customers and even the university refers to our programs as a product. My former, my former employer always talked about product and about our students as customers and I just used to say I find that offensive. I'm a teacher, I'm a facilitator, I'm working with my students to help them reach their potential. I'm not selling them a product, they're not buying a product. But, of course, money changes that equation. I mentioned the fact that students have complex lives. They do. In Australia, most of our students work. Most of them work many, many hours. The world seems to be an increasingly expensive place. Many of our students have mental or physical disabilities. They come from disadvantage, because we have this, remember, the massification of higher education, a very diverse student body. Uh, they're often carers. They might be mature age students caring for children. They might be young people caring for adults with disabilities. It is complex and comparable to that is the complexity of the staff lives. So we've got staff who are rushing off with many things they have to do, so many different things. Do they have time to respond to that Turnitin report, to follow it through, to check, to forward it on to the academic integrity officer? They're trying to get to the childcare centre to pick up their children by six o'clock in Australia, for every minute you are late after six o'clock, you pay $10, right? So you're not staying behind to finish that job, you're rushing to the childcare centre. So all these complexities impact on how we deal with academic integrity. Credentialism reigns. We tell students, you're going to come to our university and you're going to get a fabulous job at the end of it. And we then are surprised when our students, all they care about is that piece of paper that they're going to get so that they can get a great job. They forget that piece of paper represents their learning. 
All they're thinking about is the paper for the sake of it. I want that diploma so I can get this great job. But we told them that. So we're guilty. So this whole idea of credentialism impacts on both our perception of what we're offering our students and what students are doing. And we talked about the increase in competition, not just in academia, but the job market. The bottom line is it is very difficult for a recent graduate to get a job in their field, the sort of job they imagine they would like too. And it's ever changing. The job that a student comes to university thinking they're going to get, you know, in 2015, by 2018 when they graduate, that job won't even exist. Let's hope their qualification still remains relevant. So, how can we encourage the virtues? I've talked about why it's important. I've talked about courage being central to academic integrity. I've talked about looking to exemplars in our own lives, about who do we aspire to be like. How can we encourage the virtues? So McIntyre says the ap application of virtues requires shared community values reinforced by systematic training of individuals. So we've got to put some effort into this. It's not going to happen magically. A couple of years ago, a few years ago now, I did some research talking to 15 academic integrity decision makers at one university. People with a job similar to mine who were tasked with meeting with students and working out what is an outcome for your breach? You might use the word penalty. I try to avoid that word penalty. I think it's a learning outcome. If you cheated, the learning outcome is that you fail because you didn't do the work. So I try to avoid the word penalty. But I was speaking to those people making decisions. And I was trying to work out, does virtue ethics have a role to play in the way people determine outcomes for breaches? Or do people rigidly follow the rules and stick with it? Different people have a different opinion on this. Jude Carroll and I have talked about this a bit um, because consistency obviously is very important. You have a good policy, you want to follow it. But we also know on the other side, the flip side, is the complexity of every single case we come across. So rigidly applying the rules, yes, you'll get consistency. Will you get fairness? So I was interested in finding out how those decision makers determined breaches and whether they were trying to do this combination of consistency and fairness. So 15 of the 15 people openly spoke about the need for ongoing training and induction if you're going to do that role. And they talked about the importance of a strong community of practice. So if at your university you have breach decision makers, they can't just be given the job and then just left to it. It doesn't matter how good your policy is. They need real training and they need to be part of a community where they share ideas and best practice. About half of those people without any prompting from us, said they needed an exemplar decision maker. So when they took this role on as an academic integrity decision maker, they would then look to somebody else in the university and say, oh, what would that person do? How would they apply the policy? So remember, we talked about virtue ethics, looking to an exemplar. So they themselves said that, about half of the people. So we know that you need systematic training, you need to develop a community of practice, and you need exemplars. So thinking before I asked you to think about your heroes, your everyday heroes of courage. Who are your exemplars? Who are your academic integrity heroes? Who has demonstrated courage in standing up for academic integrity? It might be someone you know in the international research community. It might be someone in your own context, at your own university. It might be a student. Here are some of my heroes. And most of these people you'll probably recognise. Just about every person here has contributed to the Handbook of Academic Integrity. This is Rebecca Moore Howard, who I have never met, but whose work I read so much. She is a, a linguistics professor and talks so much about understanding plagiarism and the process of writing. Don McCabe, known as the grandfather of academic integrity in the US. Um, he's recently retired, but he is responsible for the largest number of, of surveys done across the world asking students about their cheating behaviour. Tricia Bertram Gallant, who is on the um, executive board of the International Centre for Academic Integrity, has written extensively a number of books about academic integrity being a teaching and learning issue. James Lang, a recent uh, addition to the academic integrity community, has also talked about what we can learn from cheating, cheating lessons. I mentioned Jude Carroll. 
she really started the movement, I think, in the UK and had a big influence in Australia where she, looked, she was looking specifically at plagiarism and working out how you address it. Now, we have some philosophical differences sometimes because Jude really focuses on plagiarism. My emphasis is on plagiarism is one thing. It's one breach of integrity, but there are so many, and there are so many complex factors at play, but she has been highly influential. Parker Palmer actually is not somebody who writes about academic integrity. He talks about the courage to teach. His book is fantastic. It's a very slim little volume. It's all about being a passionate educator and how you inspire that in your students, really caring about teaching and learning and I guess for the importance of the relationship between you and your students. He's been really influential in my thinking and approach to academic, academic work. Wendy Sutherland-Smith, uh, she's a colleague of mine in Australia, and she has written a great deal about uh, plagiarism and the internet. Here's Teddy Fishman. There she is right here as well. The director of the ICAI and highly influential. You're going to have a chance to hear from her tomorrow. I think Teddy's uh, definition of plagiarism is the best one that I have seen. So you'll hear about that tomorrow. It's also in the handbook, forthcoming. You can find it online too. But Teddy works hard to unpack the various elements of plagiarism and does a great job at spreading the word. This woman's on a plane 24-7, going around the world, sharing academic integrity best practice. And our colleague Erica Morris here in the UK, who has come to Australia a couple of times, has been very influential too in working with the HEA and coming up with recommendations about academic integrity. Now these people, for me, they're so real to me. They're not just someone I've read in a book. I've never met Rebecca Moore Howard, but I think of her as a colleague and a close friend uh, because the work she's done has been so influential to me. If you're interested in academic integrity and thinking about how you can progress your own research and your own practice in your university, I really encourage you to think about who are the people you look to? Who would you like to emulate in terms of your practice and your research on academic integrity? It will help you forge the path forward. So, watching the time, I think I have 10 minutes, is that correct? Yay! That's great. So, I've talked about exemplars of courage. I wanted to talk about, and I hope this type is not too small, I wanted to talk about some universities which are exemplars of courageous behaviour. The first one is an Indonesian university, very close colleagues of mine. Um, they required their students to achieve a certain TOEFL score, whatever it was, in order to graduate. And they discovered that some students, in fact it was a very large number of students, it wasn't all the students but it was a very large number, had been submitting fake TOEFL certificates. This devastated them because they had a very strong leadership program in place, they cared about academic integrity, they had amazing support, they had TOEFL teachers on hand to help these students. Why had the students done this? So it also challenged their whole department. Their whole department was set up so the students wouldn't do this. So when it happened, it would have been very easy to push that under the mat. These students had already graduated. And so it, it, for them, it was such a devastation. But instead of pretending it didn't happen, they immediately notified senior management, even though it might make them look bad. They checked the authenticity of all the TOEFL certificates that year. The fraudulent certificate students were not allowed to graduate if there were some. Many had to repeat final courses again, and that actually was a big thing, especially you know, people who are on their final course. But more than that, they didn't just go out to punish students or make them repeat classes or stop them graduating. They decided the best way was to set up a TOEFL centre on their own campus, which they ran. No more were the students going to go and have to get them from an external source. They would run the centre themselves with trained people right there. No other certificate would be permitted. So they took control of that situation. But they didn't stop there either. They'd already been doing great work in their office, but they developed a whole academic integrity awareness campaign. They had posters, they had scrolling computer advertisements, student seminars. I won't tell you who the university is, but of course it's in Indonesia and you can imagine they're Islamic. So what they try to do is show the link between the values of their religion, which is very important to them, and the values of academic integrity. And they really try to show students, if you want to be a good Muslim, you need to show academic integrity. I loved it. Their campaign made good sense to me because they were looking at what the values of the students already were, students and staff, and reaching them there. They had a leadership program which they'd already been running. They ramped that up for their students and they also focused on professional development for staff. Now to me that is courageous. The first courageous thing they did 
was telling senior management. Because it would have been easy for them just to go, okay, let's be careful in the future, but let's not tell anybody about this. They didn't. They were open. They jeopardized their own jobs. They stood up. And then they attacked it at every front. That's one example in Indonesia. Another example is a Mexican university which was concerned about widespread corruption in the general community and on campus with the leadership of their president. So this is unusual, actually. I find most times academic integrity tends to be led from the bottom up. Staff, teachers, you know, academics who are concerned about it start to push for it. This actually came from the very top, so how exciting. The president said, we've got to do something. So this is what they did. They joined the ICAI and began collaborating with like-minded colleagues. So finding a community to be part of. They established, resourced it too, an academic integrity offices and they funded a number of key positions. So they put real resources into that. They conducted a benchmarking exercise against other universities in the region and elsewhere to see exactly where they were. They did an academic integrity survey of both staff and students to find out what they were thinking. And they did it again three years later. They developed an honour code and they made this visible in every teaching space. Every classroom you go into has the, the pledge that students make on the wall. They have to write it down, not tick a box. They have to write the pledge every time they do an assignment. They started holding a yearly congress with people from the region and uh, with international speakers to talk about academic integrity, put a lot of resources into professional development for their staff, they also held special classes for high school students and freshmen. Now, I thought that's amazing. High school students, they got them engaged. Get them before they come to the university. And they even did a presentation to parents. So the parents are on the same page. They run an annual academic integrity week with partici participation by staff and students. They do all sorts of fun activities, including playing Jenga on, on the campus. Crazy good stuff. They have a thing where they... Um, they put an ice cream van on the campus, and it's an honor system, so you can go buy an ice cream for a dollar. Nobody's there. And see if people actually pay the dollar. And what they do is all their activities are around the values of academic integrity. That's their honesty one. And when somebody puts the dollar in to pay the ice cream, they all come running out saying, Yahoo! Yay, that's great. So the rewarding, honest behavior, they never told me what they do with the people who didn't pay. Don't know about that. Whip them, I don't know. Um, but they had a university-wide um, focus on building a culture of integrity. Again, posters, computer advertising, notices on the student portal. Um, they devoted time, energy, and real resources to developing not just an academic integrity policy, but what they call an academic integrity system. Now, that's what we need to be looking at. For me, this is a, a courageous approach. It came from the top, but it had absolutely every stakeholder involved. This is an academic integrity system which doesn't make the student the centre of punishment. It doesn't make all the responsibility for academic integrity on the students. It says every one of us is responsible. And the university, perhaps because they had the president, put real resources into it. It takes money, I have to say. It takes resources. It takes support. You need staff to do these things, obviously. And it needs student ambassadors. Now, you would think a Mexican university, probably Transparency International, has them ranked pretty high on perceptions of corruption, right? You wouldn't think that such an exemplar of courageous behaviour you'd find there, but we do. Indonesia, Islamic culture, very different to our Western values. You might not expect to see an academic integrity process quite as courageous there either. But I often think sometimes where, where it's so obvious, where the corruption is so clear everywhere, maybe that's where people stand up. I don't know. And the last one, is a high, there was a high profile case, a number of cases in Vietnam, in the media of plagiarism by professors. And there was concerns that plagiarism by students was considered to be acceptable. So the, the scandal actually was about the professors. And everyone said, oh, students think it's just OK. So they took a multi-pronged multi community service approach too. They partnered with Transparency International and developed a program called Change the Way We Learn. Love that. So thinking about partnering, remember the Mexican University partnered with the ICAI. The Vietnamese University partnered with Transparency International, finding an organization which can support you. They actually got funding from TI as well. They organized a big public event. You can stop corruption by changing the way we learn. 
they again consulted with all stakeholders, high school students, university students, researchers, teachers, admin people, parents, employers, and the media. I loved that. They actually had employers from the local area come for a day to understand what was going on so they could say, we don't want a student who's cheated. So this is why it's important. They established this thing called FACE. It's called For a Clean Education. I think it might translate differently in Vietnamese. For both staff and students, they had a contest about honesty among students. They've got their own youth box channel with YouTube videos. Um, they've also encouraged staff, now this is something I don't see everywhere, encouraged staff to undertake funded research on academic integrity. So internal grants were given to staff to look at those issues. And, you know, they did the, the normal thing of revising and updating their academic integrity policy. So you can see those three examples are all truly extraordinary. To me, they are exemplars of what you can do. Because it isn't just doing one thing. It isn't just about fixing your policy. It isn't just about punishing students. I hope we never want to punish students. We want to learn and teach them, right? We want to be on their learning journey. We never want to punish them, but we want to help them learn. So think for yourself in your own context about other universities, other contexts where they've shown courageous behaviour in developing a culture of integrity. And that's actually a little picture from the Vietnamese university with all the students' posters. So I guess, you know, to conclude, we need to continually ask ourselves, you know, what would your academic community do today? What would your academic community do today if it was being courageous? And what would you personally do today if you were being courageous? Thank you so much.